Welcome to the big data portion of the tutorial. In the first part of this video, we will see how to use SimpleITK to inspect large image collections. This is usually done as part of data cleanup, a common preparation step prior to feeding the data to your machine learning algorithm of choice. Also, it's always good to familiarize oneself with the data characteristics before actually starting to work with it. In the second part of this video, we will see how to use SimpleITK for data augmentation using both spatial and intensity transformations. So without further ado, let's start looking at uh, the notebooks and code. So the first thing to note is that in any Im large image collection that you receive, there will be uh, errors. Likely labeling is incorrect, or something is wrong with the images, or in some cases, uh, even corrupt images might creep into the uh, data set. And it's best to identify these before starting uh, to use the data itself. So, a, a nice thing about SimpleITK is that it supports pretty much all image formats that you would like to use. Uh, in our case, uh, this is a list of uh, all a variety of uh, image I.O. Uh, types supported by SimpleITK, and uh, you can select any of these if you want to work with a specific image I.O. as we discussed in uh, the previous video about the basics of the foundations of image reading and so forth. And remember always that the empty string just denotes use any, try to use any of these formats to read the image. If one of them works, that's the one that SimpleITK will use to read the image itself. Now, one of the, uh, the initial analysis that we're going to do does not require visualization. So it's essentially a Python script that traverses your data directory and then it uh, does an analysis of each of the files there. And let's take a look at that script. So, okay. So what does the script uh, do? There are several options here, but let's look at the code, which is uh, of interest. So some things that might be of interest are image size, uh, the pixel type that the images are uh, in there. Sometimes an image looks like it's a grayscale image, but it actually is a color image where the uh, single channel is repeated multiple times. That's pretty much a waste of memory, but uh, I've seen it happen many times where uh, people convert, uh, a, a, for instance, a chest x-ray which is originally in a DICOM format, single channel, and they convert it uh, to JPEG or PNG and replicate the same channel three times. That's just a, a waste of memory uh, when you're going to feed it into your uh, data analysis pipelines. So uh, it's good to find out what exactly is my data because you can't only rely on visual inspection. So beyond pixel type, other things that uh, image characteristics such as spacing, the image origin, axis direction, and uh, the min and max of the intensities. In medical imaging, you often have high dynamic range images, so they're not limited to 0, 255. I've seen uh, many cases where uh, people blindly essentially squish the whole range into 0 255. You probably could do better if you start with a high dynamic range and convert it to low dyna dynamic range if that's what you need, but do it in a smart way. Uh, don't just take the whole range and squish it. Uh, additionally, we can take a look at uh, metadata uh, that is found in the uh, in the image dictionary, for instance, in DICOM, this can include uh, a lot of interesting things such as the patient orientation and all kinds of other uh, things that might be of interest to you. So uh, that's that. Uh, finally, uh, this script is also able to uh, accept an, uh, an external program and run it on the file. This is useful in our case, we'll use it uh, to validate that the images are actually DICOM compliant. Uh, 
we use a script from a program DCIO DVFY uh, from David Clooney, uh, who has really nice tools for uh, working with DICOM images and analyzing them. This essentially validates that it, uh, con uh, that it complies with the DICOM standard. Uh, you'd be surprised how many of uh, your DICOM images don't comply with a standard. So that's when we analyze a single image, but if you're working with, if you're familiar with working with medical images, often a volumetric image is uh, so is stored in, as a set of uh, 2D slices. So we're, in that case, we would not be interested in analyzing them image by image, but we would like to aggregate all of the images together and uh, look at that volume and the statistics of the intensities on that and uh, the other characteristics of the volume size and so forth. Uh, this script also does that. Again, using simple ITK, we're able to collect all the images that belong to the same uh, series uh, and then read them as one volume. Uh, the nice thing about this implementation is that uh, the series does not have to reside in a single directory. Sometimes a series is uh, broken up into several directories and then it's uh, uh, on you to aggregate them together. So uh, in this case, the script does that for us. Uh, the, again, as I said, we select the image IO that tells the script uh, this function what uh, images should it be actually reading. In this case, we're going to be reading all uh, types because the default of uh, the empty string says try and any image type, that's fine. So let's run this script in the first approach where it's file by file and see what it reports. So we'll output and the output file is called generic image data CSV and let's see what we have here so the first thing is the file name and as you can see uh, we ran it on the uh, on this tutorial data directory and that is a heterogeneous data set we have color images 2d images 3D images in a single file, 3D images as a set of DICOMs. We've got really a plethora of uh, all kinds of files there. In addition, we have files that are not an image. So this script will report that it tried to read that file, but there's actually no information with respect to what that file uh, contains because it's, it was unable to read it. So image file name, then there's an MD5 hash of the intensities uh, comprising that image. Now, the interesting thing with this is that it allows you to compare uh, intensities, in, in the whole image to others to see if you have duplicates. There, it's different from equivalence in simple ITK, where in simple ITK, uh, the intensities have to be equivalent and the origin, the spacing, the direction cosine, uh, so uh, this is just looking at the intensities. Are the intensities uh, equivalent? And we can quickly sort the, uh, the spreadsheet and see if we have duplicates. Image size, we're interested in and in seeing all the variations there. Uh, image spacing, we can see you know, that uh, this is uh, a volumetric image and it has a non-isotropic spacing, as we can see here, which is of interest. Again, uh, this is direction cosine, the uh, pixel type, and we can see that uh, this is a high dynamic range image. We can see the minimum is two, the maximum is uh, 1626, and this is uh, failing on uh, the external program that is checking for DICOM uh, conformance, obviously because it's not di a DICOM file. So that's that. Uh, the di this, for instance, this is an MR slice and just a random name there. And you can see this is the size of that slice, number of pixels, uh, spacing, 
origin and uh, this is the pixel type there and these are uh, this is the min intensity max intensity this appears to be uh, probably an empty almost empty slice uh, in that mr series and it succeeded so it's dicom compliant and as you can see we went through I don't remember how many exactly images. Let's see. So we went through close to a thousand images very quickly. It allows us to get an idea of, okay, the, this is the distribution of the intensities, min, max. This is what, uh, these are the characteristics of our data set. So that's uh, when I treat them on a per file basis. But as I said, in medical imaging, you often work with DICOM, and those are, uh, we need to look at the uh, MR slices, but not independently. We need to look at the, the whole MR scan there. And now we're just going through the same da data directories. Now, put and what was the uh, DICOM and let's see what we got there and we can see that out of all those close to a thousand files actually a lot of them belong to three scans one is a CT it has 283 slices so that's 283 of those files we saw in the previous uh, uh, CSV file they actually belong to this single CT scan this is uh, an MR scan with 352, and this is another one with uh, 352 too. So the majority of actually the files in our data directory belong to these three uh, DICOM scans, and we can see the min intensity for the CT minus 3024 goes to 3071, and again, different values, high, high dynamic range for the MR and the CT. And as you can see, we can analyze our data very quickly and get a feel for what is, what is it that we actually have at hand. So that is a, qu a quick way of uh, summarizing the large data set that you have. But uh, that's often not enough and you would like to do some visual inspection so for that we'll go back to our notebook and again here we're just running a couple of this is setting again the data directory we did that characteristic already running the script and here we have a processing an image a in this case, because we want to visualize and we have a heterogeneous data set, what we're going to do is convert all the images to grayscale because we're going to be using a grayscale based approach to displaying uh, things. And uh, volumetric images are going to be projected, parallel projection onto a given axis and then after we have this set of 2D images, all of them grayscale, we're going to resample all of them and create a tile, tiled image. And on top of all that tiled image, we're going to create a foie volume. So we're going to mimic a volume, but essentially its slices will be tiles where each uh, tile is comprised of a uh, essentially an image, uh, uh, the original image just resampled. And we'll see how that uh, is done in a second. So uh, beyond that, there's a, a need for displaying that and interacting with that data set. So this is a way to quickly look at your thousands of images in a notebook. So we create this uh, foie volume and then you can click on an image there that links it immediately to the image name and in this case this uh, this viewer that I've written here accepts a function. It accepts a function and it doesn't know what that function does but it gives it the image file name when you click on it and in this case we have a function show image it will just open that image and display it in 
Fiji. If you're adventurous and highly not recommended, there is a function RM image. So if you're uh, cleaning up your data and want to immediately delete it, you can just click on it and link this function to the viewer. And when you click, it will delete the, the uh, file or files. If it's a scan, uh, if it's a, uh, a DICOM series. So let's run this and we run it and we create uh, these uh, the volume and uh, as i said earlier the uh, other interesting thing is you can work here with uh, this is uh, the some our tutorial data set it's not too large there is a a, a data set of chest x-rays from the national library of medicine uh, that is uh, sort of in the Goldilocks range. It's not too big and it's not too small. It's close to 10,000 images. Uh, the link to it appears at the top of this notebook. And you can run that and experiment with that before using it on your data sets. But let's take a look. Uh, oh, uh, one final thing. Uh, after creating the, the image and the image list, because these are associated together, uh, what I use here is I use pickling, which is the a Python method of uh, terminology for serializing it out, essentially taking the uh, binary blob and dumping it to disk, and then we can take the, read the binary blob back from disk. So if this takes a long while and you don't want to deal with it, you just run it and go home and uh, come back later and uh, run the visualization. So this is what the uh, tiles look like. So this is a single slice, but as I said, I created a for a volume, so it has two slices. So these are all the images in the uh, Simple ITK tutorial that you're looking at uh, condensed into a this uh, very tiny format for uh, presenting and for quickly looking at it. So let's click on one and we clicked and it should open any second now and there it is in uh, Fiji. We'll click go back to our so that was just a x-ray. We have here is the simple ITK old logo. You can see, as I said earlier, everything is converted to grayscale. So let's click on that. Clicking and it opens it in the image viewer of our choice. And here it is, the old simple ITK logo. And again, it allows you, uh, the reason that I open it in, a, in an external viewer is that I want to really inspect the image because the tiny uh, uh, tiles there are sometimes not sufficient to, uh, to understand if, it's the, if the image is uh, corrupt or not what you expect. Again, you can control the size of, the, uh, of the, uh, these images and the size of the uh, tiled uh, image. So here I think it's 20 by 20. And so that's these images the interesting thing is here let's go to the other and as i said earlier uh, for volumetric images we uh, project them using uh, a maximum intensity projection and then uh, resample that so let's select this image and let's see what open what it opens and as you can see this is a volume so that volume that this volumetric image was projected uh, along the z-axis maximum intensity projection and then resampled to the tiny uh, stamp sized image and tiled into that big tile so that we can really quickly examine and see that we don't have some weirdness happening there so uh, if you're uh, in the chest x-ray domain and you are expecting AP uh, frontal uh, chest x-rays and you're getting lateral, you can quickly identify those in that interface and uh, get rid of them because that's not what you want to be training if you're uh, training to uh, do all kinds of segmentation or other uh, nice things with those uh, chest x-rays. So finally, we've got our selected files. And if now I want to 
I'm convinced I looked at them, I'm convinced I want to remove them, it's trivial to write a loop here that just removes all these files or moves them to a, to a different directory so that I don't have to deal with them. So that's that. Now, as I said earlier, DICOM images often come in a series and I don't want to see all those. Th so many of these are just slices coming from the same series and that's not what I, I'm interested in. I'm interested in that volume. So same thing, just this time we're going on a di uh, using the DICOM reader only. We're very specific. It is much faster, again, because there are fewer images there. And then my interface obviously only has three uh, volumes in it. We saw that earlier in uh, the uh, CSV file that was generated by the script. So let's select this. And it'll open the volume in Fiji. And we can scroll through it you can see it's a, a famous CIRS abdominal phantom if you're from a computer aided interventions you have probably worked with this one so with that again in this case I selected that volume and that volume is associated with more than one image and these are all the images that volume is associated with. So if I want to clean up that volume, that's not a volume that I want in my data set, it's an outlier or something else is wrong with it, pretty trivial to get uh, to move it aside. And uh, again, this allows you for really rapid inspection of thousands of images. I've done this on data sets that have uh, had uh, uh, between 20 to 50,000 images and uh, you pretty quickly uh, are able to skin, skim it and identify uh, Im some surprising images that should probably not have been included in those data sets. So with that being done, said, now that we know how to examine large data sets, let's uh, create some because obviously we don't have enough data. So. Uh, in this notebook, we'll look at data augmentation for deep learning, both a spatial uh, transformation-based augmentation and intensity-based augmentation. So we run our the regular setup here. Data, as usual, I'm reminding everyone, output goes into a dedicated directory. You don't want your code and uh, data and outputs to mingle together because that creates a big mess. And now let's read our data here. And it's a, these are two volumes. And we're just taking a, two images, two slices from this, as you can see. We're just taking the central slice from each uh, of these two volumes. And as you can see, this is not uncommon in uh, CT or MR. Most of the uh, image is not data. Most of it is just, you know, air. And well, while uh, it's interesting to learn from these, it, you probably want to retain the uh, informative portions of the image and not keep the whole thing. Again, up to you, but we'll show you here how to uh, get the only the informative thing. And as you can see, this really does lend itself to a thresholding based uh, a, a cropping. So what this uh, function does is use Otsu's thresholding function. And then we use uh, the, uh, we identify the label and we can get a the intensities of the background in this case, which is also of interest to us because uh, later when we do a uh, data augmentation, when we rotate the image, we want the uh, pixels that are in the background to uh, have that same background uh, intensity. 
Uh, otherwise, just setting everything to zero, you'll get uh, interesting artifacts there. So again, uh, in this case, we get a bounding box, and uh, it allows us to uh, using uh, the label shape filter, label shape statistics image filter, and that allows us essentially to do a nice crop for these images. So here it is. It, it works and we have uh, just the informative region of the uh, data. So uh, easier on our deep learning, given that we need to resample this to, uh, uh, to a fixed size, we would probably uh, want that all the, uh, all the pixels to actually contain relevant data and not uh, uh, half of the pixels are just, you know, background. So, Let's use this modified data. And we'll start looking at uh, augmentation using spatial transformations. So the first thing is that uh, we want a reference image. We need to define that reference grid and everything. All of the other images will be resampled. All of our uh, images, when we do the augmentation, are resampled to that grid, to that fixed sized grid. And in this case, we are looking at the physical size of the uh, images themselves that were given as input, and that informs us on what a reference, what should the uh, size of the reference uh, image be, so that we can uh, work with that appropriately. And again, uh, with Simple ITK, we have two choices. If you don't care if your pixels are uh, anis anisotropic, you can set the uh, the size of your reference uh, image to whatever it is some to some arbitrary size 224 by 224 for uh, example here but in this case we're setting it to 128 by 128 and then that determines what is the reference spacing because we have its physical size of this image and then we say okay we want this number of samples in that region alternatively we could uh, still maintain that physical size, but say, okay, for a one dimension, I'm setting this size, but I want my image to be isotropic. My space, my pixel spacing needs to be isotropic. So this single number and the physical size of the image determine what is the, uh, uh, what is the spacing that we need to use. So again, uh, one thing uh, here, there is a long uh, text essentially saying if you need to transform a point from index, from an image index to a physical point, use the transform index to physical point because that takes into account all the physical characteristics of your image, which are, are its origin, its direction cosine, its spacing. You can do it on your own but it's very painful and error prone, use the built-in functions. So that's that. Let's just run this cell. And now for the data generation, this just uh, runs the resampling, writes the image, it uh, has a basic transformation and then adds the augmentation transformation to it in a comp composition. Uh, now, uh, this code as is will work in 2D and in 3D. The uh, issue in how it's implemented here is that in 3D it'll generate a ton of images. So, uh, 3 to the power of 7 parameter combinations times 3 volumes. So, we have way too many data sets uh, generated here if we work in 3D. But again, you can run this co code uh, in 3D and uh, generate uh, your uh, augmented volumes. So let's just run this. And uh, same trick as previously, because we're working with 2D images and I wanted to display the different uh, uh, spatial transformations. I uh, essentially uh, created a, a FOI volume where I'm uh, just concatenating them and this is 
These are all the tra spatial transformations that we took that ori those original images and you can see scaling and rotation and translation and all of that fun stuff happening there. Uh, and again, uh, you can play around with the uh, window leveling on these images uh, to get better uh, display and so forth. But uh, this is uh, irresp uh, this is uh, tangen tangential to the uh, fact that we're doing uh, uh, data augmentation. But uh, just so that you see that uh, we mean what we're what we say that this should work both in 2D and 3D. Let's rerun. Let's rerun the whole thing and see how we do it in 3D. And here, this is just as it says here, comment out the following line if you want to work in 3D. Yes, I want to work in 3D. So we have the uh, images and when I'm working in 3D, you can see, uh, yeah, I have a, a stack here for this. I have a stack here for this image. And now let's just continue. And, and no, I don't want to, in this case, again, you can see the cropping. As I said, we got rid of all that uh, additional data. That is just air. Let's uh, continue here. And create the reference domain. In this case, it's going to be 128 cubed and not 128 squared. This is the data augmentation function again. And here I'm going to let it run for a bit, but then I'm going to kill it because it takes a, it takes a while to generate 6,000 plus volumes from these uh, images. So let it run. And then let's kill it. And let's go see what uh, what's in our output directory. And as you can see, it's naming each of these based on uh, the parameters that were used to create the augmentation. So let's see if uh, I can open ITK Snap, my go-to. Uh, 3D viewer and let's just drop don't remember if this is the 3D no yes this is the 3D so if we had uh, not done this uh, rotation in 3D you couldn't get these types of orientations for your data. So uh, again, the the cropping here is a bit problematic because I cropped some stuff out when I did the augmentation. So I might, uh, I should probably not have cropped for this data set. But again, you can see that the or rotation, the data augmentation has been done in 3D and we can go back to the notebook. Okay. So what about flipping? Flipping is sometimes used. Uh, uh, oops, let me uh, rerun this again just in 2D so that we can go back to the regular workflow and things should work quickly. Kernel restart and we'll clear the output. And let's let it, where, is, where are we? Here we get up to the flipping. So run everything above so that we are back in business. And so flipping. So uh, flipping is uh, might be useful uh, when you uh, are uh, working with the contralateral uh, an anatomical structure. So left hand, right hand, 
and left lung, right lung, so forth, uh, you might uh, use that. Uh, again, y there are different approaches to flipping. You can do it, uh, we did it analytically here by identifying, okay, this is the affine transformation that represents flipping. We can use resampling to flip the image, or we could re uh, resample the image onto the uh, reference grid and then flip it. But that that is uh, that that would create an image that is slightly different in the simple IDK equivalents. Uh, if you're doing deep learning, that doesn't matter to you so much. So let's flip, and the images are flipped, as you can see here. This structure is at the bottom, uh, above here it's at the top. So we just did this flipping. Uh, other interesting aspects, you can do radial distortion or any other distortion that you're interested in. Uh, this is just has a mathematical model. If you're working with uh, endosco endoscopic images and you're rendering virtually uh, using a pinhole camera model, you might want to incorporate radial distortion in that uh, setup. So let's run this. And as you can see, we took this image this is a grid image which is distorted with the same distortion as this image because here it's slightly harder to see the uh, radial distortion uh, versus when we're looking at the grid where it's, yeah, it's obvious. Uh, so again, that, that's a, a artificial uh, but, uh, you know, a relevant uh, type of uh, spatial transformation. Another option, again, for the interested reader, you can mimic breathing or any other uh, deformation where you can use registration, for instance, to learn the deformation and then map that deformation to a new data set. Uh, we're not going to go into that, but uh, it's a possibility. Homework. Uh, so uh, go try it on your own. Uh, now that we've gone over all of the uh, spatial transformations, we can uh, so use simple ITK to do a variety of intensity-based modifications. We have a variety of uh, filters for blurring, smoothing, edge-preserving, smoothing, adding noise, and uh, uh, adaptive histogram equalization. Uh, what I'm doing in this code is I'm creating a list, and in the list I add each of these filters, what they have in common is the execute method. That's how you invoke them. But each of them has a different setup. Uh, we have uh, for Gaussian, we need the sigma to, uh, for the smoothing. Uh, for the bilateral image, we have the domain sigma and the range sigma. So each one has a different setup, but I'm pushing them all into the same list, one after the other, and then uh, after I've pushed all these filters, intensity uh, modification filters into the list, I can just iterate over the list and call them one by one and uh, call their execute method. And that's what I'm doing here. So let's just run this. And as you can see, this is blurring, a variety of blurring, Again, adding noise, and uh, as you can see, you can play around with the, the settings on those filters to see what you, you get, uh, but uh, a variety of intensity modifications and trivially to apply. Uh, Simple ITK also has a sigmoid. It's slightly more flexible than what you would encounter in your deep learning sigmoid activation function, uh, but uh, it's interesting, you know, you can map the intensities. You can see really how it's uh, creating a dramatic effect here. And as uh, we can play with the curve steepness here, let's just do that. Hey, it says so in the text, well, then we must do it. And you can see <laughs> the, uh, really the differences here. And let's go with, we can invert also as part of this operation by just uh, setting to minus. Again, 
a variety of intensity modifications that you can use with the sigmoid function. And finally, the standard histogram equalization. Unfortunately, ITK and simple ITK do not have this very basic uh, filter, but we can roll our own. Uh, interestingly, uh, the, the, this implementation here is uh, slightly more flexible because uh, when uh, the target range for the histogram equalization might not might not be the same as the pixel range that uh, that the image has because of the and the if you have 12 bits representing uh, the values in your image they're going to be stored in 16 bit but you do not want your histogram equalization to go to up to the 16 bit because that's not those are not valid values so uh, here you can control that uh, there's finer control here but again histogram equalization of the two images again you can see the his, the intensity modifications and finally a more sophisticated variety of things that you might encounter in medical images where there are multi multiplicative and additive uh, intensity biases and so forth. You can simulate those and you get the, this brightness here and it dissipates towards the edges. So uh, with that, we have concluded the uh, big data portion of the tutorial. Uh, that is... We'll see you in the next portion of the tutorial.